Greetings, gentle people. I'm B here, and we're back to report in on week three of the Georgia VTC Draft League season one. Before we get started, as usual, I've made a document to pair up with what I'm talking about here. So if I don't quite have the dulcet tones you're looking for in a video, or you just want to quickly access that information, uh, I've dropped a link for that document down below. Everything's sectioned out for ease of access there. And of course, in this video, I've got timestamps for you, so you can go ahead and skip ahead to different sections. Last but not least, also in the description below, there's a link to the Georgia VDC YouTube channel. Um, go ahead and see the full matches that we're talking about in this video. Go ahead and visit there. Uh, we've got some wild matches this week, so I do highly recommend it. Now, with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. For week two, my prediction accuracy was uh, drastic to say the least, but uh, we made some ground here in week three. Now, it's still early in the league season, but we're slowly getting a grasp on the player's mastery of the game um, and the resourcefulness in using their selected drafts. Based on what we've seen so far, those results look pretty par for the course, but I think the most surprising is Esquire's win this week to improve to a 2-1 overall record. In my initial analysis, I pointed out that this was one of the weaker drafts, in my opinion, um, in terms of uh, flexibility and their strategy, um, the overall power, and the identity. Uh, all that's just fancy words for saying I don't know what their overall strategy is, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but hey, they're holding their own against the competition so far, and I hope they continue to prove me wrong. There was only one trade that went active for this week, and that was Luminary's trade of Maractus for Alolan Executor. Now, I'm guessing that Professor Walnut may have unintentionally had something to do with this, as they've been using the Executor recently in the April 2022 International Challenge. That said, is the trade worth it? Well, if we take a look at Luminary's full draft, I'm a little bit skeptical, um, but it could have some use. Uh, the team obviously has a trick room mode where executor could fit right in but they've already got the trick room setter filled by uh, jellicent as its role now the upside to it if there's a matchup where jellicent doesn't want to show up uh, perhaps versus a grass or electric type that's where the executor can fill in resisting both of those types now when you add in cursula to the mix which is kind of a primary target to put in the, uh, the trick room mode um, you're adding, you have two different Pokemon that have both have a dark and ghost weakness. So they're going to want some help from the Alolan Persian or the uh, Grimstar, Grimstar to get started. But we'll see how Luminary implements this into their strategy in the future. I'm going to go ahead and get ahead of myself. Uh, it was not able to make an impact on what was brought along for the matchup this week. Now, on to the matches. First one is Strider versus Evanescence. I think everyone may have been a bit curious to see how this would go, uh, given Strider's current record and the waves Evanescence is making, despite their record and having what looks like a weird team composition if you looked at it at first glance. Uh, the players are discovering that their team is not exactly a slouch and can actually stall out a number of different offenses. Uh, that said, this week they opted for a more offensive lead themselves, uh, leading both games with the uh, early turn Dynamax Thunderous, the defiant version, you know, to try and get the ball rolling early. They possibly recognize that the Landers Therian from Strider's side has been a consistent lead, uh, so they want to get the free attack boost from the Defiant on turn one. Now, unfortunately for Evanescence, this wasn't enough to run away with the game. Landers T, even taking an airstream, answered right back with Max Rockfall. So, for every bit of damage Thunderous could bring out, Landers answered right back. Um, on top of that, with some Sandstorm Chip and Will Wisp from the accompanying Rotom Wash, that would keep the Thunderous at bay. Now, I think that was a crucial part in dismantling Evanescence's team, since outside of Dynamax, they have some trouble with their general offense. Now, with Dynamax spent, both uh, genies being knocked out, the game, the first game, transitioned into you know a complete advantage state for Strider. Um, the rock, the rock type weather ball came out for Venusaur into the Cinescorch since the Sandstorm was up, and uh, the Gudra actually had Sludge Bomb to handle the Sylveon that uh, Evanescence brought along with them. I positioned to a weird late game where the Umbreon was left to 1v3, and it looked like it could have potentially done it, but 
residual damage was too strong. Um, it stalled out the remaining Venusaur and Gudra on uh, what snarls, and their special attack was gutted as well after having used uh, Draco Meteor and Leaf Storm, respectively. Um, but there wasn't enough Moonlights to you know, overcome the burn damage overall. So even stalling as far as it could, Umbreon couldn't bring it back. Now in game two, Strider made a, a different adjustment, recognizing, hey, hey, I don't want to give a free Defiant boost away. So they brought in the Torkoal in the Landris's place. Now what this would do, the Rotom was still there to burn the turn one Dynamax Thunderous, and that would successfully stall out you know, the early Dynamax turns. Sacrifice the Rotom brought in the Venusaur which kind of ran away with the game with the, the G-Max Vine Lash afterwards. The you know, stacking chip damage was just too much for Eevee Nessus to handle, and the Landorus was able to position it at the end of the game just to clean up very easily and uh, put the finishing touches on a 2-0 week for Strider. Next up, let's take a look at Poppy Kantan versus Papa Shuckle. Say both of those names five times fast. This one went down to the wire, despite what I thought to be a match in Papa Shuckle's favor. Again, this just shows how ingenious our players have to be when the elements of their team are limited. Poppy Kantan showed some cool strategies this week, actually, leading the games with either Trick plus Lagging Tail Meowstic, um, also have access to Fake Out, and or Choice Scarf Crocodile with Rock Tune, uh, planning to slow down Papa Shuckle's offense one way or the other. On the other side of the field, Papa Shuckle heavily favored a consistent Klefki plus Charizard lead. And despite two ground types on Kantan's team, they also brought Regilecki in the back for a uh, total of two out of the three games. Now I can kind of see the concern here as if you're looking at the Primarina, um, it may have resisted most of the team's damage, um, especially if it decided to Dynamax. So having a backup option to do some significant damage to it may have looked valuable uh, going into their selection. Now their fears were put to rest uh, relatively early in the set. Uh, turn one, game one, we saw uh, the Crocodile um, locked into Rock Tomb. Um, along with the, the Meow Stick alongside it. So they were able to secure a good position by switching in the Urshifu into Charizard's slot, um, which would then fire off a Wicked Blow. Uh, Primarina came in to take that um, and got over half their health crushed in the process. Uh, so they had to be feeling good about that going into the later stages of the game. Um, from there, Poppy Kantan was unable to secure a good Dynamax position and already having used the Power Herb on Clefable for the Meteor Beam, targeted into the Regilecki, uh, Charizard was just able to clean up in the last stages of the game for a pretty quick game one. Now, game two, however, Poppy Kantan made a pretty good adjustment. It turns out they've been hiding Akaberry on the Excadrill the entire time. So they opted to use a Meowstic to support it with Fake Out onto the Klefki, preventing any uh, reflect from going up. Um, and then Excadrill was able to withstand Charizard's G-Max Wildfire and immediately KO it uh, with Max Rock Fall. Papa Shuckle tried to answer back um, with a revenge KO, but Poppy Kantan's expert piloting of the team pushed them into a corner where only Regilecki and Klefki were left. With both Excadrill and Crocodile left, there was unfortunately just no way for a, a Regilecki to come back in a game three was force. Final game, final adjustments. Papa Shuckle leads both Charizard and Urshifu to immediately put pressure on the Excadrill. Um, opting for a defensive play, they go for max guard on the Excadrill in turn one, um, but immediately find themselves at a spiraling disadvantage. Uh, the next turn would start trading KOs, beginning with Urshifu knocking down the Excadrill through its max. And this would continue on until the final turn, where Galarian Darmanitan, Papa Shuckle's uh, secret weapon, um, was able to KO the Clefable. Crocodile KO'd it in turn, and the last Mon standing Urshifu KOs Crocodile for an explosive ending to this set. Moving on, let's talk about Professor Walnut versus Mocha. First off, let me just say that I'm highly disappointed that we didn't get to see Galarian Moltres face off versus the original Moltres that Mocha brought along. With that out of the way, this one is one of the uh, more solid, drawn out sets, going the distance of three games. Game one, Mocha led with their usual combination of Spectreer versus Grimmsnarl to feel out the situation. 
Professor Walnut took advantage of this with their Galarian Moltres plus Sableye, trying to get nasty plot boosts and snowball from Moltres' Dynamax. Moke was able to mitigate some of the impact, but with Spectre down and a sleeping Grimmsnarl, thanks to Togetic's yawn in a later turn, they were forced to Dynamax Salamence to make up for lost ground. While this was enough to pick up a few KOs, it was not enough to deter Redisteel, the last stand for Professor Walnut from stacking up a couple of iron defenses and securing game one in a 1v3 situation. Even through a, uh, a boost in Metagross had its uh, weakness policy blocked in an earlier turn. Game two was a bit of a grind where both players continuously switched to maneuver and wear the opposing team down with status moves. The Walnut cracked first, yes, pun intended, <clears throat> In an unfortunate switch from Porygon Z to Moltres, where Grimmsnarl's Spirit Break snatched away half of its health. Forced now to Dynamax the Porygon Z, he was unable to break through Mocha's defense while getting thoroughly worn down himself. Once Porygon Z's Dynamax was spent, uh, only a minimal effort was needed for Dynamax Salamence to clean up. For the final game, Professor Walnut decides to shift gears into another turn one nasty plot turn two Dynamax with their Moltres, supported this time by Togetic for redirection. Now, this is something that could have turned the tide of the set until Togetic was put to sleep by Yon. Despite the offensive advantage that Professor Wana got, Moltres was not well, it was well stalled out by Mocha and only able to pick up a KO on the Swampert during its last turn of Dynamax. So he found himself again in a precarious situation, this time facing down a Dynamaxed Assault Vest Salamence and quickly running low on resources. Now to salvage this, he brings in his secret trump card, the Focus Sash Dracozult, which he had just picked up and put into play this week. Um, hopefully he was trying to get a, a quick revenge kill to make up some ground, but unfortunately the hustle ability backfired on him and he missed the much needed Dragon Claw aimed at uh, Salamence, who was still pretty healthy. The only Redisteel left versus a Taunt and WoW Spectre that had been hidden in the back of Mocha's team at full health, uh, Mocha put the final nail in the coffin on their week 3 win. This match highlighted one of the things that I emphasized when I first analyzed, um, analyzed a Redisteel for this draft, where if you have a solid ghost type with Will-O-Wisp, it would easily counter it if the player could keep it healthy long enough to meet the Redisteel in the late game. Spectreer is the most noble Pokemon in this regard. Even during Series 9, it was common to have both Taunt and will o in a bulky set to counter uh, such a strategy. And we saw games both where Registeel was able to steal a game when the Spectreer was gone, as well as an adjustment made to keep the Spectreer hidden until Registeel showed its face at the end of the game. Uh, last but not least, make sure to check out Professor Walnut's perspective on the match, where he goes over his thoughts before, during, and after the game. Link to his videos in the description below. So there's not much to say about Esquire and Bruno's match, and that's with no offense to the players themselves, but this 2-0 win for Esquire played out very similar in terms of the game flow in both games, which itself is kind of interesting. To explain, both games had Lapras lead with the G-Max Resonance, as is typical. Both games had Ferrothorn Dynamax after the Lapras finished this Dynamax in response. Both games had an end game where B Sharp was involved in the closing of the game in some way. Now, credit to where it's due though, for all that I've mentioned that Esquire's draft seems varied in its strategy where it doesn't quite seem to have um, an identity, their overall plan in this set seemed pretty straightforward and it had its potential strengths. Um, Dusclops had access to Rock Tomb and Trick Room, so paired with the uh, the weakness policy on the Lapras, I can only assume that it was meant to have Lapras do much more damage under uh, Trick Room than it was currently putting out at the normal speeds. Um, but I have to assume that they were deterred from setting up Trick Room in fear of the Ferrothorn. Uh, keeping a normal speed mode is what allowed uh, Raikou and uh, B-Sharp to clean it up in game one. And then uh, same thing in game two, uh, except Marowak was able to finish it off. But um, also props to Bruno and their prep for this match. 
knowing that the Lapras would immediately resonate, I think that's obvious, um, they switched their strategies in game two, and they uh, brought along yet another secret weapon for this week, Luxray with Guts and Flame Orb and Psychic Fangs. So this was a kind of a neat way to try and counter the Aurora Veil that was set up by the Lapras, but unfortunately they weren't able to take full advantage of it as their partner Pokemon were either too slow to attack before Lapras set it back up again. Uh, and then additionally, after the Lapras finished its time, it's G-Max, um, Esquire moved uh, B-Sharp into Lapras's position, um, preventing the Psychic Fangs from going off and keeping the Aurora Veil intact. So I'll say it again though, creativity like this is kind of valuable in these kind of draft leagues where approaching strange matchups um, like this, and you kind of like to see it. Paddleback versus Bazook was an interesting set in a bit of a weird way. When you look at the team selections, you'll notice something peculiar. Paddleback brought his uh, Lightning Rod, Raichu, and Garchomp for the ride and Bazook opted to bring their uh, Alolan Raichu and Tapu Koko duo this week. You would imagine this puts Bazook at a disadvantage, but he actually um, put forth some win conditions in the opening turns of the games that honestly could have earned him a win. Unfortunately, these conditions were not enough to overcome the uh, Celesteela, which did a great job in these games. Um, in game one, turn one, it was difficult to tell who would actually gain the advantage, because. Uh, Every single move just kind of put each player ahead one at a time. Uh, Whimsicott started off uh, taunting the opposing Tornadus on Padillac's side, preventing it from setting up any Tailwind. Uh, but Padillac reads into this and uses Icy Wind to, to get the uh, speed control instead. I think this would be great until it activates the weakness policy on the Dragonite, who is now Dynamaxed, and targets down the Celesteela, also Dynamaxed, uh, with a Max Flare, which barely avoids killing it. Um, to finish off the turn, Celesteela gets a uh, speed boost from the max airstream. So now their side has uh, the speed advantage overall. Um, following turn, they go ahead and knock out the, uh, the Dragonite. Another Icy Wind comes through just to maintain the speed advantage, even with Tailwind coming up from Whimsicott. And Celesteela finishes it off with a max rock fall. Um, from there, the Celesteela was just too strong, able to survive throughout the game, um, and able to close out comfortably for a Padillac for game one. Now, during that game, Padillac did indeed reveal that they would bring Raichu to protect the Celesteela and Tornadus from the electric duo. So, in this case, Bazook kind of shifts gears and makes an adjustment, says, okay, we have to take care of this Raichu first. Um, so that I'm able to fire off these electric attacks, attacks into the team. Uh, he plans to do just that, brings in the Alolan Raichu along with a Dragonite um, in an effort to bait the Raichu. Uh, doesn't have to wait too long. Padillac ends up leading with uh, Celesteela and uh, their original Raichu. Um, they win, now Bazook wins the speed tie with Fake Out into the Raichu and gets a quick knockout through Dragonite's Max Quake. Um, so that's obstacle number one out of the way. Obstacle number two is still in play with the Garchomp, so Raichu still can't make too too big of a move. However, its moves can't be redirected now, so it can still be um, make for a good target into the uh, the Celesteela. Um, now, at this point, though, the Celesteela already has um, a plus one speed boost from Max Airstream, and the incoming Garchomp has a uh, Dragon Claw equipped. So. With the speed advantage, they go ahead and knock out the Dragonite with Max Rockfall and Dragon Claw. That was honestly Bazook's best bet for actually doing damage to Padillac's team at this point. Um, so with it gone, he was unable to handle the uh, Garchomp at the end of the game, unable to avoid the uh, O2 loss this week, despite some pretty impressive starting plays, if I have to say so myself. But congratulations for Padillac to improving their record uh, this week. Uh, very balanced and solid team comes through. Finally, we'll discuss Luminary versus Sinido. Even with some success in using units like Tapu Fini and Cinderace, Luminary opts for a Trick Room strategy this week, complete with Rage Powder Butterfree for some redirection. It seems like they were looking to flip the Steam Engine Colossal strategy on its head, which is exactly what they did in Game 1, Turn 1, when Sinido immediately G-maxed, 
surfed with Sneasel and grabbed a quick KO on uh, Luminary's Butterfree with Vocalith. The accompanying Jellicent, however, used this opportunity to set up Trick Room and bring in Cursula, who would Dynamax and knock out the Colossal the very next turn. Um, so Colossal's glory was short-lived, but the remaining Vocalist damage was already starting to you know, pay off. Um, Jellicent had fired off a Water Spout the next turn, but it wasn't able to do significant damage to the reigning Sneasel. Um, so it was able to actually chip away at two different ghost types uh, through beat up, which was a surprising tool to actually come through. Um, so through solid steady play, Sonata was able to actually stall out both Trick Room and Cursula's Dynamax turns, which led to uh, Zapdos and Sneasel in the end game versus a lone Mudsdale. Uh, Luminary decided to move on to the next game after that. Game two was a much cleaner win for Sonido, uh, who led Zapdos instead of the Colossal versus uh, the same leads for Luminary. Uh, he may have gotten a little bit lucky though. Uh, Jellicent decided to target Sneasel with Taunt, and this choice would allow Snido to just snowball out of control, uh, picking up chaos left and right on Luminary's entire team. Butterfree, Jellicent, uh, even the, uh, the week's trade, Alolan Executor that came along, uh, was also short-lived. Cursula was eventually a force to come in and Dynamax, but without the Trick Room support this time, um, they weren't able to make a comeback, and Sonido takes the set 2-0. Now, with Week 3's matches out of the way, let's take a look at Week 4's matchups and my personal thoughts on who will come out on top. I'll give the first matchup to Luminary. This is actually a, a bit of a toss-up, but I would say... Bazooka has been underperforming in their matches, whereas Luminary is actually showing that they have solid tools to take crucial games, despite the results. This is yet another G-Max versus non-G-Max mirror, however, so I'm more than willing to change my mind if I see Bazook's Butterfree win while beating up Luminary's Butterfree. For match number two, Papa Shuckle has had uh, trouble when it comes to breaking through defensive play, and I think that's just Professor Walnut's type of game. It's possible it'll go three games, but I think just on that fact alone, uh, the good professor takes the set. Mocha uh, still has my favorite draft, so I've got plenty of bias left for it um, in this matchup versus Esquire. You know, despite that bias, I just believe that their draft is much more solid than Esquire, so I think I can easily grab a 2-0 victory very cleanly. For Bruno versus Padillac, it's an unfortunate matchup to have this week because I do want to see and believe that they can. Um, Bruno put a win on the board, but Padillac is also commandeering a draft that I really like. Uh, but the one saving grace for Bruno is that their trick room mode could potentially overwhelm Padillac's high speed mode. Um, you'll see that it has like the max airstreams coming out from Celesteela pretty often, as well as Tailwind from Tornados. Um, but even with that, it's still an environment that Celesteela can survive in the Trick Room mode and potentially still have a high impact in, so we'll have to see. For the next matchup, I'm going to favor Evanescence over Sonido, but this is another set that could go either way. Sonido's offense is very heavy on the front end with, with the Colossal and Steam Engine strategies, even with leading um, Max Zapdos uh, to gain an advantage. Um, and I think Evanescence has plenty of tools to cripple those strategies and wear Sonido down, then come back in the late game and go ahead and crush him. That said, if Sonido grabs the tempo, perhaps with an early KO, the games can easily snowball in his favor. Now lastly, Strider versus Poppy Cantan, that'll be interesting, but Strider's got the overall advantage. Along with the considerable a considerable gap in the players' current standings, uh, Poppy Countdown's draft, I believe, will have some general trouble breaking through just Landorus Therian alone. And it'll be much more trouble when you have to deal with um, Torkoal and Venusaur for Sun strategies behind that. Uh, that being said, after you know, week three and his performance there, I am curious to see what Countdown will cook up, see if he can possibly knock down the current number one down a peg. All right, now all the fun stuff's out the way, so let's take a look at the current standings. Strider continues their streak and maintains a number one placement. Mocha and Padillac aren't too far behind, but they may need at least one clean 2-0 and o from uh, one of the future matchups to overtake Strider uh, in the event that they take a loss. 
Sonido, Esquire, Papa Shuckle, Poppy, Poppy Content. I'm going to mess that up so many times. And Professor Walnut fill out the middle of the standings. So the epitome of the players whose games could go either way whenever we see the matchups for the week. And finally, Evanescence, Bazook, Luminary, and Bruno round out the lower end of the rankings. Um, all with more than enough potential, I really do believe, not being facetious here, um, to rise in standing, especially with four whole weeks left in the regular season. So keep at it. Now, once week four wraps up, I'll consider revisiting the tier list I created for the drafts in my initial analysis and see how it stacks up in comparison with the current results. In the meantime, let me get your feedback on this content. Though. I want to hear from you on what your predictions are from this week's matchups and if there are any other details about the league that you like me uh, to bring up just in general. But that's all from me for this week. Again, please check the description for all relevant links. But until next time, take care and thanks for watching.